Would you believe that there is a rugby team out there that wants its fans to abstain from sex? Would you believe that? And Christine O'Donnell lives up to the book title that she just came out with, Troublemaker. Welcome once again to Culture Clash. Brought to you by Flood Brothers Disposal Service. I'm Chet Kopic along with the adorable... Catherine Saxon. Thank All right, uh, welcome aboard, gang, as we continue with Culture Clash. Uh, now, uh, the New Zealand rugby team, uh, what's, what's the story on all this? Okay, uh, so their team what's, is, what's is called the All Blacks, which can you imagine that going over very well in our country? Yeah, they like that would not well fly. in uh, Selma, Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> um, they just made a video encouraging fans to um, abstain from sex for the entire World Cup in support of their team. What's next? I stop reading National Geographic. I I <laughs> give up Playboy. <laughs> I mean, can you? I I don't really understand um, what was their incentive behind making this video. Why Why would you ask fans to do that? I mean, I guess I, I've heard before that you know you're not supposed to have sexual activity yeah. right before games. So is that is that what? Well, really, that's something that relates itself to boxing. Okay. For for years and years and uh, solely most, boxing. I've most, heard that with most other sports. Most doctors will tell you it's nonsense. That a fighter, you know, six, eight weeks in front of a bout should abstain from sex because uh, dames weaken fighters' legs. Okay. So, um, having had sex the night before I played softball, I'm here to tell you that I can be just as bad if I have sex or don't have sex. <laughs> So that applies for everyone. Well, Absolutely. I don't really think the uh, fans are going to oblige to this, but we'll... Uh, <laughs> or, or the name the All Blacks. I, I can't get over you that. there will be a record number of babies conceded this month in New Zealand. <laughs> All right. Mayor Rahm Emanuel, so it's, it's his 100th day in office. How do you feel he's done so far? Success? Not success? What, what, what's your... He's intriguing. He's constructive an interesting criticism. guy. Uh, the one thing I'm not crazy about with Rahm Emanuel is he took, uh, and this may sound very petty on my part, but he took uh, Kinsey Street, which is a very busy street right by the uh, apparel center, right by the Merchandise Mart, right by the East Bank Club, which, right, of right. course, is my home away from home. I know, you're and always there. And he made it bicycle heaven. And when Rahm Emanuel said, I want to make Chicago the world capital of bicycle safety, I thought, uh, why don't you work on our school system for openers? Hello? Hello, uh, Rom. That being said, the uh, first 100 days I would give Emmanuel uh, uh, a very solid B. Okay, that's fair. I, I actually think that the new um, chief of police, what's his name, Gary McCarthy. I the Irish guy. Okay, I actually think that he seems to be sort of a strong guy and he's doing a decent job so far, so I thought that that was a good decision on well, Rom's part. Well, it's not like he's got a rough act to follow. I mean, Jody Weiss came out like Beaver Cleaver. Okay. I mean, true. I'm just saying, obviously, that was a good decision on his part, at least so far, and seems to be he's making some big changes. And for, you know, our city's deficit, he's accumulated $51.3 million so far, in which he said that he was going to reach $75 million. So, I mean, he's going to make continue to make some major cuts, but I think, you know, he was handed, um, you know, a, a storm, so to speak, and I think he's doing a decent job of trying to manage it all. Do no, I agree I, with you I, on I the bicycle it. thing? Yeah. I know I know it's politics, but the fact that he's uh, looked at a guy like Ed Burke and said, no, you're not going to have six bodyguards. I like that. Right. I like that. The council wars are way back in the 1980s. Ed Burke doesn't need six bodyguards. Six bodyguards don't need Ed Burke. Burke can be happy and content driving himself to work with one bodyguard. Tops, high end, you shouldn't even have that. Yeah, uh, Ram said this is just a down payment, just the beginning. So I like that he actually said that um, about his performance. And he said, that, you know, I haven't, been, I haven't done his a His perfect... performance, here we are, back with the New England rugby team. I know, okay. The New Zealand rugby team, whatever the hell it is. <laughs> um, okay, the situation from uh, the Jersey Shore. We've talked yeah. about this show several times. Abercrombie and Fitch just offered this guy a substantial amount of money to not wear their clothing line. And get this, their stock actually went down after they made this annou announcement, which I would actually think that it would go up. That, that shocks me because I would think the people who are stockholders in Abercrombie would realize this is all a gimmick. It's a hustle. It's a PR stunt. No more, no less. This is Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. This is not meant to be taken seriously. I mean, the fact that they would come out and make this statement, though, I would think that they would do some sort of analysis on how this is going to affect them in the long run, and their stock dri drops down nine points. I mean, that's, that's pretty, again, substantial. Well, kiddo, let me, let me break the chain here right now, because we have to acknowledge. Okay. 
two great names in the history of rock and roll. Oh yes, who have left us. I know this is before my time, and I, you know, enlighten me. Salad is a rock. Nick Ashford is gone from Nick the tag Ashford. team of Ashford and Simpson. Most notably, recognized for the writing they did for uh, uh, Marvin Gaye, for example, during the glory years of Motown. Okay, big Along names. Along with Jerry Lieber, who wrote the song "Hound Dog." Jailhouse, Jailhouse rock. rock. He did not write the song for uh, uh, Hound Dog for Elvis Presley. He wrote it for Big Mama Thornton. Now, what I find interesting about this is going back to my New York days, there was a building, and there still is in Midtown Manhattan, called the Brill Building. Carol King worked out of there, Neil Sedaka worked out of there, Lieber and Stoller. Uh, virtually all these young Jewish kids from Brooklyn. And what did they write? They wrote, for the most part, R&B. For right. the Drifters and Benny King and the Coasters and other R&B groups. The groups that, in essence, paved the way for what we know as the genre as rock and roll. And to me, I think you should, you should really take time tonight to Google up Jerry Lieber, Lieber and Stoller. So That's that fair. Your generation really understands that there would be, there, there would be no That he paved M &M. the way. The, okay. There would be no Dave Matthews without Lieber and Stoller. That's fair. I mean, and also, did they help um, not, uh, the other guy? Did he help uh, that wrote Jailhouse Rock? Did he help, you know, sort of carve Elvis's career? Yeah, because songs like Jailhouse Rock and Hound Dog were what got uh, uh, Presley on the old Ed Sullivan show, which right. at that time was the television show, uh, was the appointment television show in America on Sunday nights. I mean, we could do, we could do KS an hour and a half on this guy, and we really wouldn't be giving him uh, what he justifiably deserves. I mean, a genius has left us, really. Okay, well, my generation, Google him tonight. Okay, so I can tell she's overwhelmed. I, I uh, you can feel the grief. <laughs> I, I do feel the grief. 10, 15 seconds. I, I wish we could play Jailhouse Rock right now. Okay. Worn through a party in the county jail. <laughs> There's a man was there. They began to wail. It's it's just not the same, but I, I appreciated the effort. Okay, bears. I haven't got hips like Elvis Presley. I've got hips like Aretha Franklin. <laughs> I, you know what, I agree with What's you on that What's our show point? without a booty joke? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bears, can you talk to me about their loss against the Giants? I just, I feel like, you know, obviously there's an issue with the offensive line, and I, can we address that? You know, is this going to be a continuation for the rest of the season? Well, yeah, it is going to be a, a problem, I think, for the uh, entire regular season. Offensive line acquitted itself reasonably well against the Giants, but the defense looked terrible. I, I feel like that might actually give me more anxiety than the, offense, the offensive line. I mean, Lovey, what's going on gamble? over there? Do you, do you gamble? I don't. Do you, do you I, I'm, not, I don't then, then I'm not a gambler. Then why would you bother to have anxiety? Anxiety is for the generous like myself and Mike and Corey who bet like crazy on pro football. Okay. You know what? I know I have friends that bet like crazy on pro football. I don't personally do it, but um, unless I know I'm going to win. But, um, you know, I... That's well, probably why I'm not betting on these I'm games. I know I'm going to win. Right. I, I, okay, so, I mean, obviously we gave up like 56 sacks last year, most in the NFL. Yeah, right. And then, obviously, we have the off season, and I'm wondering, we're below the salary cap of like around $24 million. So what are we doing with this extra money? Why don't we get well, a big name for the offensive line? Well, the dough, the dough has line? got to go somewhere because... I'm wondering where. Can you tell me that you're the based expert? Based on the collective bargaining agreement with the National Football League players, you've got to be within, I believe, 96% of your salary cap uh, maximum. Right. So the Bears are going to have to add new blood before the regular season begins. Okay. They're so going to have to redo contracts, et cetera, et cetera. It, but this, this offensive line right now, it looked reasonably good in the Meadowlands, but don't get conned, don't buy the Kool-Aid coming out of Lake Forest. Right now, the Bears, as we speak, are no better than an 8-8 eight eight football team. All right, well, I keep saying we needed a big name, but is there really even a candidate for us to be able to, to grab with the leftover money that we have, which is a substantial amount again? Off the top of my head, digging really deep, okay. I mean, really giving you all the football expertise I have to offer. Right. I can't think of a single individual. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Me neither, and I'm and I'm no expert, so I feel like we're coming to terms that with this. That reminds me of I'm No Angel. Let me show you my tattoo. Who did that song? Nails on a chalkboard right there. Great okay. Woman. I appreciate that. Thank okay. you. Uh, okay. Talk to me about this Oklahoma State Cowboys coach, Mike Gundy. I mean, apparently he fires his carpenter for wearing rival's co colors. Sh guy shows up in an opposing T-shirt. I got and, tell you. I mean, really? And the fact you. that this is making the news, I mean, every news channel, they're talking about this. 
I know, I know Oklahoma State people in Stillwater are a little bit nuts. I also know this, uh, KS. The people in Norman, Oklahoma, who root for Oklahoma, are full-blown nuts. They are uh, consumed by two things, uh, the Old Testament and uh, Oklahoma football. And, and the fact that you would fire your carpenter because he wears a T-shirt, yeah. which indicates support of a rival football team, I got news for you. That guy needs couch therapy immediately. I mean, obviously this isn't comparable to, you know, the fights that were going on with the San Francisco 49ers and the Raiders, okay? But which, to me, I just don't, all of the stuff that's been happening recently, it's, I, I, I mean, you're taking the fun out of the game, out of, out of the rivalry. I mean, you're, you're people going to this extreme, you know, and more areas than one, obviously, we've been talking about. I just, I, I, I don't understand it. Okay, let's talk about the Raiders for a moment. Okay. If you go to a Raider game at the Oakland County Coliseum. Okay. The fans, these these nutcases who sit in the end zone and dress like uh, dress like Kiss, they begin showing up on Friday night, and they camp out and they drink, and it's like a meeting of every biker gang in America. San Francisco fans like quiche, white wine, and the opera. <laughs> so it doesn't surprise me. I mean, <laughs> that, like that they wound up with, with a little bit of grief. Uh, the rivalry has been suspended. Right. They they will not play again, at least in the uh, in the preseason. But I mean. Dudes, where the hell are you? I mean, this is like Jagger and Altamont, December 6th of 1969, when that poor African-American kid got, uh, uh, got whacked by a member of the Hells Angels. I mean, this is a sick country we live in, for heaven's sakes. It is pretty sick. Not that I want to shock you. <laughs> <laughs> We're just figuring this out. Okay, did you see the Pierce Morgan interview that he did with um, Christine O'Donnell? No, I didn't, but I understand it was uh, very engaging. All right, so she walks off during the set, now, and she's there to, to promote, promote her new book that is ironically labeled well, Troublemaker. And so in her book, she addresses some of her um, opinions on gay marriage address? and gay rights and um, uh, abstinence, really? actually. No, um, so Pierce yeah, asks her about, away, about the, you know, her opinion on those issues, and she is so offended by this, says that she should be talking to Michelle Bachman over this. And he's like, okay, well, this is well, stuff that's in your book. Can we address it? Republican she says no, talks to somebody off the set, and um, calls him um, rude and walks off. I mean, it was... That, not to be, I, I, I you know, was embarrassed for her that she would... Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you can't even... He, just just answer the question. The Obviously, you're a politician. We we know you've stated your beliefs before. What's the big deal? I mean, she made herself look like an even more of an idiot that I already thought she that she was so all right are we off you know what i can't say anything else i, mean, I said it that, that well one. thank you you've nailed that one i mean and completely i mean the ratings that that must have gotten i mean kudos to pierce for just you know laughing it off and um handling it well really it well. builds it builds pierce's stock totally and i mean he said where, where are you going i'm still here uh you know rude I'm, I'm sorry i was just asking you questions that actually pertain to your book and he ends the interview with Troublemaker, uh, Christine actually living, living up to her book title, but um, it's actually a good read, and so, I mean, he even ended the awkward interview smoothly. Hey, by the way, God bless Don Rickles. The 86-year-old comedian, a summon in St. Charles this past Saturday night. Yes. Not as sharp as he was 30 years ago. I'm not as sharp as I was 30 years ago. 30 seconds ago. 30 seconds ago. 15 minutes ago, for that reason. <laughs> but he still made a full house a turnaway crowd, laugh like crazy, got three standing ovations, and all I could think of was, I got 24 years to go. If I live that long, please let me be as cool and, and as, as hit, funny and as funny as Don Rickles. Agreed. Well, well, well said. All right, that is a wrap for uh, Culture Clash. We thank you for joining us. We thank the marvelous people at Flood Brothers Disposal Service for their uh, cooperation and their continued support in the face of. Uh, Gosh only knows how many Turmoil. nasty emails. <laughs> I'm Chad Kopic along with... Catherine Saxon. We want to thank our good friend uh, Corey for his marvelous job on camera, sound, and lights. We'll catch you in seven days right here on Culture Clash. Until then, peace, love, and soul. That was down <laughs> I thought I was going to say rock and roll. I thought we were going to say rock and roll. Later. Take care, gang.